Good morning, everybody. Um, it's awesome to have you all here. And what we're going to do is I'm going to walk us through um, the Forms 95 and the addendums to the Form 95, which I put up on the, uh, the Facebook Live and the YouTube video on Monday of this week. Um, so look for the, that May, whatever that is, May 24th um, video if you actually have questions about any of the documents I'm referring to. But let's go ahead and start with um, the, the first kind of critical form, which is the addendum to Form 95. For those of you not familiar with this work, what I did starting in the fall of last year is I started monitoring a number of things that were what our organization, MCAM, considers to be anomalies um, that were happening in the, um, in the public discussion around this idea that there was going to be a, a series of potential events involving coronavirus. And what I've done in the form, which is the addendum form that you should see on your screen right now, is I have laid out the specific set of claims, which are the specific actions that were taken by um, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the National Institute for Allergy and Infectious Diseases, and the companies and organizations that were associated with these individuals. And what I've done starting with the 25th, 2003 CDC patent on the coronavirus isolated from humans, which is a violation of US patent law. I lay out in very great detail each one of the steps that the Department of Health and Human Services, the Center for Disease Control, National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, and a number of industry and academic researchers did to lead up to the events that we have right now. So the patent in 2003, the fact that in the patent, the US Patent Office granted on August 17th, 2010, a patent that covered both the detection and a kit for the detection of coronavirus. And the reason why that's important is because of that patent, no individual or organization in the U.S. could legally do independent verification of what these individuals were saying about coronavirus without either infringing their patent or licensing their patent. In other words, they had a chokehold on the knowledge associated with coronavirus. As I laid out very clearly in my videos, CDC, NIAID, and a number of conspiring parties worked on both descriptive diagnostic gain of function research, which means enhancing the virulence of a virus, um, and did so using an enormous amount of federal grants. And in this form, I actually lay out a number of detailed grant numbers, which if anybody wants to go and reference, they can, because those are the economics that public money was used to do research that both the National Institutes of Health and global people had concerns about being potentially both unethical and potentially also illegal under the Biological and Chemical Weapons uh, Convention. So there's possible illegality on more than just one front, and I do not talk about the Biological Chemical Weapons Convention illegality in this, but some of the work that was being done probably at least blurs the line, if not crossing the line there. In September 2019, Dr. Anthony Fauci and Chris Elias, who's the president of global development for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, sat on the World Health Organization's group called the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board, the GPMB. And this gathering was when they wrote in a final report called A World at Risk, they wrote that by September 2020, there had to be a UN World Health Organization system-wide respiratory pathogen scenario that was run to prove preparedness and readiness 
for member states. That document was published in September of 2019, and <clears throat> it was using information that came from all of what I refer to as the conspiring associates, but specifically, it was coordinated by Dr. Fauci and Dr. Chris Elias, as well as a member of the, uh, the director of the Chinese Center for Disease Control. Now, I just wanna pause for a second and point out to you that many people have talked about event 201, which was the event in Chicago, that actually talked about the, the spread of pathogens and, and kind of the scenario planning. But very few people are talking about the September 2019, the thing that came ahead of event 201. So when, when people talk about these things as though they just happened to emerge and they just happened to co-occur with what nature did, there's a little too much evidence to suggest that there were too many things with too many individuals controlling the narrative to make this a purely random set of experiences given exactly what has unfolded. So this, this um, obviously gives rise to the fact that they, and I'm gonna just quote for you, the United Nations, including who, conducts at least system-wide training and including one for covering the deliberate release of a lethal respiratory pathogen. Okay, you can't misconstrue what that says. Those are their words, not mine. And that had to be done by September 2020 in their model. Then obviously, January 21st, 2020, the US reports its first case of coronavirus in Washington state. But interestingly enough, if you go back and you look at the timeline trouble that we have, the problem that we have in the timeline is that on the 21st, we reported the new case, but the official declaration of the novel coronavirus, the official declaration, which was the International Committee on the Taxonomy of Viruses, didn't get published until March the 2nd. So we have oh, almost a month and a half between when allegedly we measured the thing and a month and a half later when we finally described what the thing was. I don't know about the rest of you, but I just have a little bit of a time time uh, zone problem with that, right? If, if, if we're measuring precisely a thing that we didn't really know was unique until a month and a half later, there's a tiny little problem with the timeline. Um, and I didn't bring up any of the time machine technologies that they must have used to pull that one off, but that was pretty impressive. Um, on the 31st of, of January, Department of Health and Human Services, Alexander Azar is the first one declaring the public health emergency in the US. And the reason why that's important to these claims is this serves as the first potential date that you might use on Form 95. And I'm gonna get back to that in a minute. But on January 31st, 2020, the official declaration of public health emergency came out. Now, mind you, three days earlier, there was an official statement being made that said that the public in the United States was not at risk. But regardless of that statement, on the 31st, the Health and Human Services Secretary, Alex Azar, made the declaration of public health emergency. And as a result of that, on February 4th, that opened up what's called the Emergency Youth Use Authorization. This is a very important principle and very few people understand it, but what this does is it gives medical technology companies, pharmaceutical companies, medical device manufacturers and others, it gives them the ability to do any research and development they want with no legal liability. That's what that is about. That is about opening up a absolute immunity to the medical community. And that is actually something that has created enormous public damage because obviously billions of dollars are now flowing into companies for whom zero liability exists. As long as the emergency use authorization exists, they have backed their truck up to the freaking bank and they're running the printing press and taking bills out of the bank. Seriously, it's that egregious and they have no liability for their actions. So it is critical that you understand that that January 31st declaration was opening the bank vault, and on February 4th, the robbers got in, okay? And it's our money that's being stolen, and that's billions of dollars. So that's on the 4th 
of, of February 2020 on the 10th. That's what that is about. That is about opening up. I don't know what that echo was, but we'll go ahead. Um, so on the 10th of 2020, uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci um, complained publicly that there wasn't enough public support for funding for his research, and it was published in the journal STAT. And the thing that he said was that there needed to be a means by which the public would get more supportive of providing funding to the researchers for coronavirus. Like, he needed to come up with a way to get the public to kind of bite on the hook, which was we need to get tons of funding for our pet projects. Um, if you look at the um, at the CDC's own documentation, what happens next is the point at which each and every one of you has the basis for a claim, because the CDC conducted without any informed consent, without any institutional review board approval, and without any independent physician, which is a requirement of a informed consent, the CDC commenced a nationwide public health experiment on social distancing and face mask wearing. And I wanna say that very clearly. They, in fact, have a written protocol, which is the clinical trial of this public experiment in public health. And the reason why that last whereas on page one is so important is because that is the basis upon which we can make the argument that the CDC, the NIAID, and their conspiring associates began a national clinical experiment and none of us, none of us were provided with a risk assessment. None of us were provided with the risk benefit analysis. None of us were provided with independent facts because not only were we not provided with the facts, but the conspiring parties pressured through social media and through the general media, a suppression of a discussion of the risk factors. Both with respect to social distancing and face mask wearing, the medical data that was published in peer-reviewed journals said neither one of them had any basis in fact. And anyone who promoted the question of whether they had a basis in fact was actively suppressed. So not only did they not achieve informed consent, but they actually violated the law in suppression of a risk-benefit analysis. And this is something that every single one of us was harmed by virtue of that fact. Now, that is a direct contravention of the Declaration of Helsinki, which is what came out of the Nuremberg hearings. And it's also in violation of 21 Code of Federal Regulations, Section 50.20, which sets out the requirements, even in the event of a national emergency for clinical trials. So the point is very simple we were subjected to a clinical trial for which none of us provided consent. None of us provided a risk benefit analysis. And worst of all, none of us were allowed to debate the merits of the case. So up and down, this is a violation of the law and a violation of the International Convention. And then the rest of this stuff kind of lays itself out. I'm not gonna go into a huge amount of detail because that's kind of the crescendo point because the rest of it is obviously on March the 2nd, they declared information being novel and unique in violation of their own standard protocols. So everything that we have been told about coronavirus is something that is only based on foreign data in January that was then backed into a conf confirmation story on March the 2nd that said that this is actually a novel thing, even though no scientist yet has been able to declare what makes this clinically unique. They can show you the little pieces of mutated DNA and RNA, but they cannot show you any of those leading to a clinical pathology. Everything about SARS coronavirus that was in 2002 and in 2012 in the Middle Eastern outbreak, the same mechanisms of action of the virus 
are similar across all these viruses. So nobody has been able to say that this is anything other than just a simple mutation of the coronavirus. And there could have been no independent verification because they controlled the means of testing. So even if we wanted to know, we couldn't have known because they actually had a chokehold on the means of testing. And then obviously every declaration that's been made has been based on hearsay. None of it's been based on scientific evidence. And one of the things that I do leave in this, which is important for us to understand, is that the illegal actions taken by governors, which made certain people deemed to be essential and other people non-essential, is in violation of the very well-established legal precedent that says that a law has to be generally applied. That law originally was argued in the case Juho v. Williamson, which had to do with Asian suppression during a San Francisco epidemic in 1900. So this legal precedent that says that you can just capriciously say somebody's important, somebody else isn't important, is in fact not legal. So when you fill out the form, and I'm gonna show you the form in just a second, but when you fill out this form, it is vital that you attach this because it lays out the material facts that are all of the facts that lead to your cause of action. Now, that cause of action, you now see on form 95. Everybody see standard form 95 on the screen? Cool. Yep. Beverly, I'm looking at you nod, so I'm gonna go ahead and yes. assume that this is working. So people on my YouTube channel, David Martin World, on the Facebook page, um, I know Ray's sending some stuff around. I know Beverly's sharing stuff. I know it's a bunch of places, but the standard form 95 from the Department of Justice that is a sample form on my YouTube channel is the sample form you can all use. And it has in box one, the address and the location to which you send the claim. So make sure that you use that sample form to make sure you get the address right. When you send this damage claim in, what you do is you do nothing in box one. Use the form as I have it set up for you. In box two, you put your name and address and your contact information. Box three, you type the type of employment. So your military or civilian, your date of birth, your marital status, et cetera. Now, box six is really important. The date of the accident. You can take one of two approaches on this. The simple approach is to say that on January 31st, when the secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services declared a national state of emergency, you can put in January 31st. If you are making a claim specifically for financial damages, which I'm going to get to in a second, you may be more precise, and I'm not saying you're right or wrong either way, but you may be more precise if you use the date when you had a stay-at-home order or an executive order by a governor. So what I'm going to encourage you to do is either use January 31st, which is the standard across the kind of the, the date um, that everybody was exposed to this, if not, use the date of the executive order that was the executive order for your state. If you do not have that readily at hand on my YouTube channel uh, two weeks ago, so it would have been you know mid-May, under the video, I have the date of every state's executive order, so you can go and pull that up. Um, now, the, the uh, box number eight, the basis of a claim, just say see attached pages. What you're gonna do there is you're gonna use the addendum that I just went through with you. You're gonna print that out. And if you want to add your own personal narrative, you wanna add something about what happened to you, what your experience was, things that were harmed that happened that were unique to you, you're welcome to do that. So add that. But use the addendum because the addendum is the reason why you have a claim against the Department of Health and Human Services. So make sure that you attach the addendum. Now, when it comes to box nine, 
And when it comes to box 10, I want to get really clear on something. There is a thing called fraud. What you do not want to do is make a fraudulent allegation. I'll give you an example. If I said my 10 children went hungry, that would be a fraudulent allegation because I don't have 10 children, right? You can't make stuff up here. What you can do is you can understand that property is not what all of us think property is. Property is a very specific set of legal terms. And those legal terms, I need to make sure you're all clear on. Because property has two pieces. One is intangible personal property, and one is tangible personal property. So intangible personal property is things like money, contracts, creativity, value, intellectual property, you know, all of the stuff that lives in the definition of intangible property. And that's where loss of money, loss of value, loss of co commerce. Um, there's a thing called chattel paper that's one of the things that's listed. Those are agreements that have performance obligations or agreements that convey certain rights. These kinds of things all live under the definition of intangible property. You do not have to only limit your statements here to, you know, a, a house repair that you couldn't do or a physical property damage. That's not what this is about. Now, if you have those, you can add those. But remember that property is both tangible and intangible. This is where you would put those financial harms that have happened during this period of time. In section 10, personal injury or wrongful death. The likelihood is very high that you or people that you know were unable to get to medical appointments, were unable to access health care, had different expenses because of the fact that they were prohibited from moving or accessing, you know, whatever their, their standard care or their standard health or their standard well-being is. Once again, what you're doing in personal injury is you're specifically saying these are the things that happened to harm my well-being, to harm my physical status during this period of time. Now, let's come back to this fraud thing for a second. You cannot lie. Okay, it's just that simple. You can't lie. But what you can do is make a good faith estimate. And a good faith estimate is something that you can reasonably justify, right? If you didn't go to the convenience store and didn't get your scratch off lottery ticket and you didn't win the million dollars that you were pretty sure you were gonna win, that doesn't count, okay? This is about coming up with legal, bona fide, legitimate claims. This is not about, you know, this is not your lottery ticket. This is actually very specifically a place where you are communicating the harm and damage that was done by actions taken by this federal agency. So please make sure that you don't get too crazy and conservative, but also don't get too imaginative because both of those are going to be problematic. You wanna make sure that you focus on claims that you have a good faith reason to justify. Box number 11, you sign it and you, wit you get witnesses signing it. Um, boxes 12, a, B, C, and D are just the sums of the number of the actual dollar values that you're claiming. And then down at the bottom, you see that you have your ability to sign it and date it. Now, if you go to the second page, I've already filled out the second page for most people because the fact of the matter is most of your claims will not also have a secondary insurance coverage. So for most of you, you just leave that page the way it is. If any of you have a you know, physical damage or a healthcare damage that was also claimed in insurance, you might want to go ahead and change that form. But in most instances, you won't need to do that. So that's the two forms um, that you use. Any of the other documentation and references that you want to use, you're welcome to. And um, at this point in time, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.
and then open the floor up for questions. So this content is gonna be available. Um, Ray, I'm gonna send it to you and I'm gonna send it, um, Beverly, to you and whoever else wants it. Um, but I'm gonna go ahead and, and stop recording and then it'll be good for anybody to share. Thanks everybody. And uh, we'll stop the recording then open up the mics.